Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you here today to talk about protective structures for growing specialty crops. I'd like to introduce my, my co-host, Hannah Hodge. Hannah, would you Hi. like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I work with uh, Springfield Community Gardens um, and I'm so happy to be here. I will be uh, watching the chat in case anyone puts any questions in the chat. And uh, that brings up the subject of chat. So um, we'll be recording the, uh, the uh, webinar today. And so with the recording, of course, the uh, chat won't be live. But if you're joining us live today, the uh, chat is the uh, forum that we'll use for questions. And I have a lot of material to share with you. And uh, if you want to, to dig further into a topic, uh, your way to do that is through chat. So go ahead and, and type a question into chat. If you haven't used chat before, it's a, a button on your screen. You, you press on that. It brings up a place where you can type in a question. Hannah will be keeping an eye on that. And as your questions come in, uh, she'll stop me and we'll address them. But again, a lot of material. If there's some particular area you're interested in, you want to discuss more, all you have to do is let me know through chat. Okay. Um, Hannah, we have some polls to start things off with, don't we? Yep. Okay. Do I drop those in? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and, and launch our polling. And if you haven't used polls before, again, it's just a, a question of clicking the appropriate answer, but uh, your help with this is, is uh, really nice because it gives me a feel for uh, who my audience is. So if you could go ahead and, and answer the first two questions. First of all, what type of gardener would you consider yourself? Commercial producer, beginning farmer, home gardener, or, or other? And secondly, do you use protective structures? You know, for example, do you have a greenhouse, a high tunnel, a caterpillar tunnel, or, or a, a low tunnel? So if you could go ahead and answer those for me, that would be great. Okay, we'll give you just a moment longer. Very good. Well, it looks like we have an interesting uh, blend of people on the call today. There are several commercial producers and beginning farmers. Looks like we have a number of home gardeners and, and, uh, that are with us on the call, and that's great. The information that I present is, is targeting commercial growers, but those of you who are home gardeners and thinking about protective structures will find a vast amount of useful information there as well. And as far as what people are using, several people have greenhouses, but it looks like high tunnels are in the majority among the protective structures that we're using. Okay, very good. We'll end the poll and share the results so everyone, everyone can see it. Very good. Okay, well, let's go ahead and close awesome. down the poll. Well, what I'll be doing today is I'll be sharing my screen and we'll be going through a presentation on uh, protective growing structures. Again, as I said before, uh, if you would like to, to dig further into a particular topic, let us know through chat. We're also going to benefit from the experience and wisdom of uh, several farmers who uh, I've conducted interviews with recently. They're sharing their experiences with protective structures as well. So I'm particularly excited to have that component to our workshop today. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Anna, can we see the screen? Yep. Uh, no, I, I cannot see your screen. Okay, hold on just a moment. Okay, so I'm getting a note that the host uh, disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, give me one moment. Uh, perhaps you can make me a co-host. There you go. Next step. Okay. Awesome, now we can see it. Okay, does that look good? Yep, looks great. All right, fabulous. Well, again, as I said, um, I'm glad to be with you here today. My name is Patrick Byers. I'm a field specialist in commercial horticulture with University of Missouri Extension. I'm based in Southwest Missouri. And our workshop is a partnership between Springfield Community Gardens, uh, the uh, USDA, and the University of Missouri Extension. And I want to acknowledge the Springfield Community Gardens partnership on this. The uh, a vision of Springfield Community Gardens is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. Springfield Community Gardens has secured several grants to, uh, 
to help develop the local food system in Southwest Missouri. And I'm excited to be part of that effort. Our workshop today is funded in part through one of these grants. And at the end of the workshop, we're going to ask for your assistance with a uh, survey to help us gauge the success of the workshop. And it's a short survey, I promise it won't take too long, but uh, your participation is extremely valuable. First of all, to give me feedback on the workshop, but secondly, so that we can report back to the USDA on how those funds have been used. So please uh, help us out with the uh, survey at the end of the, uh, the class. And then our third partner is the USDA. Uh, the USDA has a number of programs in place to help support local farmers. And the entry point for many of these programs is through the Farm Service Agency, or FSA. FSA maintains an office in most counties. Uh, visit that office, get to know your, your local FSA people. While you're at the office, uh, meet the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service personnel. Uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, has been a strong supporter of local agriculture, and in particular, protected culture. And at the, uh, a little bit later on in our workshop, we'll be talking about the cost share program that is available from NRCS to help support the development of high tunnels on farms. The Risk Management Agency is also part of the USDA, and they are an agency that can help develop uh, programs to, to manage risk, particularly crop insurance programs. All of these resources are highlighted on the farmers.gov website. So visit that to learn more about the USDA programs. I want to acknowledge several people that have been helpful in putting this presentation together. My colleague Jennifer Morgenthaler at Missouri State University actually developed the framework of this presentation. We've used it together over the years, so I want to acknowledge her contribution. I mentioned that several farmers will be talking with us, Curtis Millsap, Kevin Prather, and Micah Kunsley. I also want to acknowledge Sean Bishop with Lincoln University. Sean is a small farm specialist and has made a specialty of uh, constructing and using high tunnels. He's a, been a huge resource for our farmers here in Southwest Missouri. The Winter Vegetable Production Conference and the Great Plains Growers Conference have also been uh, tremendous helps in sharing with farmers the advantages of using protective structures. This is the uh, outline that I'd like to use today. We'll first have some introductory material. Then we'll do an overview of protective growing structures. We'll go through each one. We'll talk about some of the features of those structures. And again, as I mentioned before, this would be a great place to, uh, to pop any questions into the chat that you might have. We'll talk about the crops that are suitable for protective structures. Then we'll talk about both the benefits and the challenges of growing in protective structures. And then we'll spend the remainder of our time together on how you actually use a protective structure. And we'll be emphasizing high tunnels, but the information in this, this final part is, is pretty generally applicable across the other types of protective structures. So protective structure, uh, using protective structures to grow specialty crops is, is a huge, huge development in, uh, in commercial horticulture. And granted, these figures are, are a little bit dated. They're from 2009, but we can see that, that this is not just a phenomenon here in North America. It actually has been widely developed in other parts of the world. China and Spain are by far the largest uh, growers of, of crops under protected structures. In fact, there are places in Spain that you can actually point out from satellite images because of the amount of uh, uh, plastic and row cover used in those areas. In other words, they show up in space as being an area where, where uh, protective structures are widely used. But you can see from this table that protective structures are used around the world to grow a number of, of crops. Is this the future of your farm? This is actually a farm in California, and uh, the uh, crop that's being grown here is pomegranates. But uh, are we going to be covering most of the uh, growing areas in Missouri with uh, some sort of protective structure? Well, it may take a few years, but there are huge benefits to using protective structures. And, and quite frankly, a lot of it comes down to managing risk, managing risk. And particularly in these days where uh, there are concerns about changes in the climate, building resiliency into farming systems oftentimes means using structures that reduce risk. And so we'll be talking about the benefits of, of protective structures a little bit later on, but just from the, from the onset, I want to highlight that an important aspect of uh, resiliency in farming systems in, in our part of the world, here in the Midwest, 
can be protective structures. So I think that all farmers need to be considering these. Now, when we look about at the uh, situation in uh, the United States, as far as where uh, uh, horticultural crops are going, you can see where the, uh, the big states are. And these are also the states where protected culture is, is huge. But we could look at any state, and including Missouri, and we're seeing a growth in the use of protective structures to grow specialty crops. There are hundreds of these structures in Missouri. Greenhouses, three and four season tunnels. Uh, when we start to look at the use of low tunnels and other uh, protective covers on a smaller scale, you know, there, there are hundreds and hundreds of acres of production under protective structures in Missouri. Uh, the NRCS High Tunnel Cost Share Initiative has funded over 500 high tunnels in Missouri. So you can see this is a technology that is being embraced by farmers here in Missouri. Now, why would we want to consider growing in protective structures? And I asked this question to my friend, Curtis Millsap, and let's just listen to his response. Anna, can we see this? Yes, it looks great. Very good. I'm Patrick Byers, Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and it's my pleasure today to be interviewing my friend Curtis Millsap. Curtis is a farmer north of Springfield at Millsap Farm, and I've invited him to join us to talk about the reasons that he is excited and interested in growing crops under protection. What are the advantages that you see of growing crops under protection? Well, so for us, I would, I mean, being a good, uh, <laughs> being a good American schoolboy, I have a three-part answer to that. Uh, but essentially, um, I would say earliness, productivity, and then workload are my big three as far as why we choose to grow undercover. So earliness is, is fairly intuitive, but that is that, you know, if you have a greenhouse or some sort of structure over the top of growing crops, then they're going to grow faster and they're going to grow uh, to maturity earlier uh, because we can control the temperature under there somewhat. So, for example, this time of year, we're able to plant our first tomatoes the 15th of March. And that's with very minimal heat. I mean, we're really, uh, for the most part, we're not heating. I have a couple of propane heaters that I can put in there to kind of buffer on really cold nights. But for the most part, I'm just relying on that single sheet of plastic or a double sheet of plastic over the tunnel to give me about a one month to a month and a half uh, jump start on my field tomatoes. And so that earliness then leads me to be, you know, one of the earliest markets, uh, farmers at the market with tomatoes and cucumbers, which are our two big tunnel crops. Um, eventually colored bell peppers, although they're, they're much further along, but they're still earlier than others that come into the market. And that means that we capture that early market share. And um, so on the one hand, that means we're selling a product that nobody else has to sell. So we're kind of cornering that market. But it also means that by being the, the early, early marketers of a certain crop that is desirable, something like tomatoes or cucumbers, then people come to us and then they tend to stick with us through the season as well. So Millsap Farm becomes their farm, or the place they're going to go to for their farmer's market. And then on the, you know, the, on the CSA end of things, that earliness means we're keeping our customers more satisfied because really um, there's only so, much, so many heads of lettuce that you can put in a box of produce before people start to get a little anxious. And so we want to round out those shares as early as we can with things like tomatoes and cucumbers, bell peppers that, uh, that are kind of the more, I guess, in some ways more commonly utilized vegetables. So that earliness is a big deal. The second reason uh, is level of production. And so it's both quantity and quality. Um, in our tunnels, we expect to get somewhere between minimally 10 and 15 pounds of tomatoes off of a plant. Out in the field, we're doing really well if we get you know, six to eight pounds of tomatoes off the plant of marketable quality. And so there's, there's the quantity issue, but there's also just the fact that out in the field, there's more things to happen to them. Um, and so, you know, we'll talk about a couple of those. So tomatoes, for example, are, you know, being a, a big tunnel crop, uh, one of the big advantages of growing tomatoes quality wise in a tunnel is we can control the water. 
And uh, so that means it's not going to rain on them. It's not going to hail on them. The wind's not going to blow on them. But the rain issue is a big one. You know, anybody who's grown a lot of tomatoes, uh, garden or otherwise, has had the experience where you go out and you've got this lovely crop of tomatoes that's getting really close to being ripe. They're looking great. And then overnight you get a big thunderstorm. The next morning you go out and it looks like all the tomatoes have had firecrackers put on them. You know, that somebody has blown up your tomatoes. And what's happening there, and, and you can... Uh, you know, correct me if, I, if I'm misleading anybody here, but my understanding of what's happening is as the tomatoes get ripe, the skin gets tougher. It gets more brittle. And, you know, which makes sense because green skin is going to have to continue expanding. But as tomatoes get close to ripeness, they're not going to expand more. They're just now putting more sugar into those those cells and they're, they're converting that, uh, you know, sort of green structure into a ripe structure. But they're not growing anymore, so the skin gets tough. The problem is when you, uh, when, when the the storm dumps a ton of water onto those plants, the extensive root system of a tomato plant will suck all that up. They're Mediterranean climate plants. They want to, uh, or, or sorry, they're not Mediterranean, but they are a dry climate plant. And so they want to have access to that water. They'll pull it up into their roots, pull it up into the plants, and then they'll stick it out of the fruit. And unfortunately for us, that means those fruit are going to crack because they don't have uh, skins that can still expand. All that to say, that can be sidestepped in a tunnel because now we're controlling how much irrigation goes to those tomatoes. So we're giving them a steady supply, we're not oversupplying, and we're not undersupplying. And by doing that, uh, we get a much higher quality harvest. So, you know, we're gonna have more tomatoes because of the vigorous growth, which we can get into a little later, but we also are gonna have much higher quality. So, uh, so out of my tunnels, for example, I expect a 90 plus percent uh, rate of saleable tomatoes. Uh, and that's that's pretty consistent, you know, uh, barring some sort of insect invasion, we will have almost all of our tomatoes will be saleable. On the other hand, in the field, if I get 50% that's marketable, I feel like I'm doing really well. Um, tomato Field tomatoes for us are just really problematic, partly because of our hot, dry, and then rainy conditions, and partly because of all the other things that want to happen to them out in the open that a, that a roof can protect them from. So that's our quality and quantity uh, sort of production end of things. And then the last piece of it that's probably the least intuitive as far as reasons to grow undercover is smoothing our workload. And so, you know, the weeks like this are a great example. We've had a lot of rain this week on the farm. And so that means we're dealing with a lot of mud on the field. We're dealing with wet soil conditions. You know, we can't till, we can't plant, we can't seed into mud. But in the tunnels, we're still able to do that work. And we're able to stake tomatoes and, and you know, transplant peppers and all these things that we would want to be doing outside, uh, but we can't. We're still able to get a lot of that work done inside. And then when the weather's nice and the soil's just right, then I can move outside and have my crew working out there. And so what that does is that evens out our load. So we're not trying to get all of our work done in the, you know, this year maybe one day a week when the conditions are actually right to be working in the field. Instead, we're doing our field work on those days, but then we've got other productive paying work that we can do the rest of the time in the tunnels. And so that really is nice because then now we're not uh, running a schedule where we say, oh, today we have to work from dawn till dark and beyond because the soil is just right. And tomorrow we're going to be totally out of work because it's raining on us. So that's one of the ways we like to think of, of our, um, you know, trying to make our lives a little bit higher quality is by smoothing that load and allowing us to kind of work a pretty regular schedule because we do have those inside and outside spaces to play with. So those are the big three. Um, earliness, quality and quantity of production, and then the, um, the smoothing the workload, evening the workload. I'm Patrick Byers, field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. And I wanna thank Curtis Millsap for joining me today to talk about his experiences with protected culture. All right. Well, that was a, a really nice overview of why farmers might consider growing in, in uh, protective structures. And I'm going to thank Curtis for uh, participating with, with that interview. So what are protective growing structures? Well, you can, you can think of them as sort of a continuum uh, from a structure that is permanent, that is uh, expensive to put in, and that is precise in controlling the environment, to something as simple as laying a a piece of row cover on top of a bed of strawberries. And so there, there are, again, as I said, there's a continuum, but 
we typically think of protective growing structures uh, starting with greenhouses, then we move into high tunnels, then we have what are called caterpillar tunnels, then we have low tunnels, and then we have row covers. And this uh, slide from a, a farm in New York does a nice job of illustrating all of these different structures on one farm. And many farms have more than one type of protective growing structure. The other thing that should be pointed out is that these are not discrete, hard and fast distinctions. Oftentimes there are, are uh, uh, sort of variations on the theme and you have a high tunnel that has additional controls present, or you have caterpillar tunnels that are more or less in a permanent location, or you have low tunnels that are nearly as big as a caterpillar tunnel. So again, these are not hard and fast designations, but it is helpful to think of protective growing structures in terms of, of their uh, sophistication and permanence. And we'll get into each one of these different types here in the next few slides. So what is a greenhouse? Well, typically we think of a greenhouse as a durable, permanent structure. It's frequently attached to a foundation and it's frequently complex from the standpoint of its structure and also from the standpoint of the controls that are present to monitor and modify the environment. Typically it's covered with one to two layers of plastic or it may be covered with a more durable covering, uh, glass for example, or rigid plastic. There are control systems to maintain the growing environment, the uh, systems that will control temperature. They also will control humidity and sometimes light exposure. And oftentimes greenhouses are intended for year round production. Okay, so growing crops not only in the uh, spring, summer and fall, but also through the cold part of the year. Frequently greenhouses are utilized for a, uh, specific types of growing systems. And this picture here shows a hydroponic lettuce house. And again, hydroponic lettuce is a high value crop and it is at its best when it's grown in a highly controlled environment. Hence, a greenhouse is a good place to grow a hydroponic crop. What is a high tunnel? Well, high tunnel shares some characteristics with greenhouses. They frequently have durable structures, although the structure tends to be less complex. Uh, typically, a high tunnel is covered with one or two layers of greenhouse plastic. Uh, it's typically unheated and the uh, heat gain in a high tunnel is passive, passive solar heat. Now, uh, on many occasions, supplemental heat can be provided, particularly with crops that are started early in the uh, season or carried late in the season. But frequently, there is not a permanently installed heating system in a high tunnel. The uh, ventilation on a high tunnel traditionally has been manual by raising and lowering vents such as side curtains and the vents on the end walls. Uh, although uh, increasingly we're seeing high, high tunnels that have some degree of uh, assisted ventilation. The uh, structure is in some ways temporary. It can be dismantled. Uh, in some cases, the tunnels actually are designed to, to move from one area to another, but they also are relatively permanent as far as where they're located. They're not as portable as some of the structures we'll see here in a moment. And high tunnels can be used for forest season production, but typically the production of crops in the late fall, winter, and early spring are cold tolerant crops. It generally is not economically feasible to heat a high tunnel to, to grow tender crops, to grow warm season crops through the cold part of the year. So most high tunnels share three structural components. They're frequently constructed with a framework of steel hoops and supports. And then these hoops and supports are covered by six mil greenhouse grade plastic. This uh, plastic is expected to have a lifespan of at least four years. The ventilation is typically uh, passive through roll up or drop down side curtains and through vents in the end walls. And frequently high tunnels are sited on field soil. And crops are grown in the soil or in beds or raised beds within the, uh, the tunnel, but still on the field soil. Uh, some terminology on high tunnels. Uh, you'll hear uh, farmers talk about ribs and purlins and pit boards and, and uh, this diagram points out the different parts of a high tunnel. The ribs are the framework of the high tunnel. They're sometimes called the bows. The purlins are pieces of metal that connect the ribs together to help make the structure rigid. The uh, baseboard and the hip board run the length of the high tunnel. The uh, hip board and uh, the baseboard frequently are wood, but they can also be metal. The uh, side curtains are attached to either the baseboard or the hip board and then rolled up or rolled down depending upon the design. And then there are curtain cords that help hold the curtains in place. And uh, as I mentioned before, the cover on a high tunnel is frequently greenhouse grade polyethylene. 
Now, again, comparing and contrasting high tunnels and greenhouses. Frequently, a high tunnel is a relatively simple structure, and it's definitely lower cost. Passively heated and ventilated, although we are seeing some uh, high tunnels that have uh, active ventilation and supplemental heat sources. Usually one to two layers of greenhouse grade plastic, useful for season extension, in-ground production, low operating costs, and the site may or may not need, need to be leveled. Greenhouses, a much higher initial investment in structure, in the utilities that are needed for the controls, and in equipment. You've got to be thinking about things like heaters, fans, and cooling. The covering may be plastic, but it may be also rigid materials such as glass. High energy consumption in greenhouses, higher maintenance operating costs, and frequently you need extensive development of the site for, uh, for the, uh, the greenhouse. You may need leveling, you may need the construction of a pad, either gravel or concrete. And in some cases, the uh, construction of a foundation on which to site the greenhouse. Now, again, as I mentioned, there are gradations. Uh, is it a greenhouse or is it a high tunnel? I was recently visiting on a farm and, and approached what looked like from the outside to be a high tunnel. It had the structure of a high tunnel. It had the, uh, the uh, ventilation on the sides and on the end walls. But then when I entered the high tunnel, I realized that, no, in fact, this is a greenhouse. This was a hydroponic house. There were uh, uh, controls in place. The upper picture shows the uh, cooling pads and the lower picture shows the uh, uh, propane heating unit, and also you can see the ventilation fans that are in place to, uh, to improve ventilation in this particular house. While this house was not sited on a concrete pad, it was sited on a prepared site that was uh, covered with uh, weed barrier fabric. So again, the, uh, the uh, gradation between a greenhouse and a high tunnel can be in place. Now let's talk about caterpillar tunnels. Um, Caterpillar tunnels are simple structures, and they are temporary structures. It's, it's very straightforward to break down a caterpillar tunnel and move it to a new site. Typically, they're covered with one layer of plastic. In dimension, they can approach high tunnels in size, but frequently they're smaller in dimension than a high tunnel, uh, particularly in the width of the uh, caterpillar tunnel. They're unheated, with, and the uh, solar gain is, is passive, manually ventilated by opening the ends, and by raising up the plastic along the sides. Again, these are temporary structures. They're uh, intended to be temporary, and they can be very useful from the standpoint of rotating crop areas around a farm. Uh, when it's time to move to a new area, you can lift up the caterpillar tunnel, dismantle it, and move it to its new site. Typically, they're, they're in place for three season production, for spring, summer, and fall production. They don't have enough structural strength to stand up to the weight of snow or ice during the winter. So caterpillar tunnels uh, share several structural elements. They're, they're frequently made of hoops that are made of steel, but they can be made of other materials as well. The uh, hoops are covered again with six mil greenhouse grade plastic, and the plastic is held in place with ropes or tie downs. And we'll see this here in a moment, but you can see in the first picture there, the uh, hoops are being, being uh, placed over pieces of rebar that have been driven into the ground. And again, we'll see another picture here. There's frequently at the base of each of the hoops, there is a tie down area. The plastic will then be placed over the hoops and ropes or other materials will then lace between the tie downs that cross at the top and they go down to the tie down on the, the next adjacent hoop. Uh, typically the uh, ventilation again is through raising the plastic on the sides or rolling up the, or opening up the ends. And they're, they're generally sited on field soil as we can see in these two pictures. So again, here's our components from the outside. You can see the, uh, the uh, rib or the bow or the hoop. The uh, plastic is in place, the polyethylene cover, and then ropes are, are then in place to secure the plastic to the hoops, okay? And then, uh, as I mentioned, there is a tie down at the base of each of the hoops that the ropes go through. Okay, let's learn a little bit more about how farmers use caterpillar tunnels. And I invited Micah Kunsley, who is a farmer near Ozark, Missouri, and his farm is First Fruits Valley Farm, to share his experiences with caterpillar tunnels. So let's go ahead and listen to uh, Micah's, uh, Micah's interview.
I'm Patrick Byers, Field Specialist in Horticulture with University of Missouri Extension. And it's my pleasure to interview tonight, Micah Kunsley. Micah is a farmer near Ozark, Missouri. His farm is First Fruits Valley Farm. So as a new farmer, you've already experienced the benefits of protected culture. Yes. And uh, you, you uh, mentioned that you have a caterpillar tunnel on your farm. Can you share with us your experience with caterpillar tunnels and give us some tips on how to build a caterpillar tunnel? Yeah, so uh, it was quite the experience. We constructed our first caterpillar tunnel. It was probably late summer, early fall of last year. And I looked into a lot of different kits. Uh, I knew I wanted something roughly about 100 feet long um, and roughly, you know, 10 to 20 feet wide. And I was also operating on a budget. Again, first year farmer, you have a lot of expenses. You're trying to keep those expenses down and manageable as much as possible. Uh, and so we're not trying to cut into our profit margin a little too much really, but we wanted to build a structure that would allow us not only to grow crops through the winter or at least hold things like lettuce and carrots uh, to provide for our winter market, but we also wanted to get a head start on tomato growing in the spring. And what I looked into was a variety of different kits, but through talking with other farmers and specifically Curtis Millsap, I realized that I could build a 100 by 15 foot caterpillar tunnel for roughly about $1,100. And that was through sourcing materials uh, through other companies, not just necessarily getting it all from one place or one supply store. We uh, actually had a supply uh, store that was selling EMT, so um, kind of like one, I believe it was inch and a quarter pipe, what we used for the purlins as well as the bows themselves. And it worked out pretty well for us because it was myself and two other farmers and we were able to order a bulk uh, shipment and actually got the materials a little bit cheaper for that. Um, and then we used everything, you know, from of course wiggle wire and a channel lock to secure the plastic on the end walls. But then what we actually ended up using, I got this idea from another farmer to tie the plastic down uh, across the bows uh, instead of having an extra channel of wire at the base of the tunnel going long ways. What we actually did was we used recycled grip tape. Now you can use poly, um, poly rope, which a lot of farmers use. Again, we were just trying to keep expenses a little bit lower and we had a whole pile of drip tape that we were recycling. So we thought, well, let's try this. And so that holds our plastic in place um, across the length of the tunnel, uh, not just on the ends. The other thing I like about the design of that system is that it allows me to manually roll up the sides. Uh, that's really important, especially once we're starting to get into some of these warmer months, you know, trying to keep the temperature level down as much as possible. Uh, and also trying to filter out some of that humidity. Um, so that's kind of what we did as far as holding uh, the plastic in place. As far as anchoring the structure, we used, I believe it was 40 inch sections of rebar and we just bought long lengths of it from Lowe's. Uh, we cut it into 40 inch sections and then we drove those into the ground at uh, each end for the bows. And then what we actually did was we had these um, I would call them anchor plates, but basically they slip over your half inch rebar and then you can pull your uh, railing, your bent railing that you've made your bows out of over that. Uh, and then you actually tie, once you put the plastic on, then you can tie your rope or your drip tape around that. And then so that kind of helps to anchor it a little bit. Um, but we sourced our materials from a lot of different companies. Uh, we use Tunnel Vision for some of our more specific hardware pieces and they were very good to work with. Um, I've worked with them and Curtis Millsap has worked with them. I think some other local farmers probably have too. Very reasonable on prices. And then uh, again, just kind of innovating, you know, specific things that might work for me, uh, may not work for another farmer. I wanted the ability to um, have easy access in and out of my tunnel, even during the very cold months and uh, another farmer gave me an idea of using what they call scissor doors uh, or a scissor end wall. And what that involved was taking one of your end walls where you have to straight plastic and then cutting it down the middle. And where that cut is, you actually put two more lengths of your railing along with 
uh, your channel and your wiggle wire, and so you can then open it, and then you can also hold it in place with either wire or sandbags or cinder blocks or whatever you may have around the farm. But the thing I like about caterpillar tunnels is they are very quick to construct. They're very affordable. If you compare them to a conventional high tunnel kit or a greenhouse of a similar square footage. Uh, but then also, I think there's a lot of room for modification, depending on um, what you're using it for and kind of the lay of your land as well. I, again, wanted to use it for winter production, uh, but then also to grow tomatoes throughout the summer too. So hopefully that kind of answers some questions as far as constructing it. Um, but that was kind of the basis for um, what we did. Micah, thank you for joining me for this uh, interview. I appreciate your insights into uh, protected culture. This is Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist, University of Missouri Extension. Well, again, I want to thank Micah for uh, sharing his experience with Caterpillar Tunnels. And, and as he pointed out, they're becoming increasingly popular because they're very affordable and they're very portable. And so they can integrate well into, uh, into new farms, but also into existing farms. And as I mentioned earlier, they are very helpful from the standpoint of rotation of uh, crops on a farm. Now let's turn our attention to low tunnels. Uh, low tunnels are very simple structures. Um, they're low, frequently they're less than four feet in height, and frequently they cover just one or two or, or a small number of rows or perhaps a bed. Uh, in many cases, there, it's difficult to, to access the inside of the tunnel without raising the side of the tunnel up. In other words, you're not going to be working underneath a low tunnel. I have heard some funny stories where farmers have said they've sent their children underneath these low tunnels and tied a rope to their, their ankles. And as soon as they're done harvesting, they, they pull the child back out. But uh, in reality, they're, they're not intended to be, be uh, uh, have people underneath them working. They too are unheated, uh, passive solar heat. Uh, generally covered with one layer of plastic, but increasingly we're seeing these used with row cover rather than plastic. You know, typically when we talk about a, a, a caterpillar tunnel, a high tunnel, or a greenhouse, we're talking about plastic. But now we're moving into the use of what are called row covers. Row covers are spun bonded polyethylene type materials. They are breathable. They allow air to pass through. They also allow moisture to pass through as well. Low tunnels are ventilated by opening the ends up or by lifting the sides. And again, very temporary structures. Uh, they may actually be used in response to, to uh, you know, particular environmental events such as a, a uh, late frost in the spring or an early freeze in the, uh, the winter. But there are other uses for them as well as we'll hear about in, in just a moment. So they, they share several structural elements. They're typically supported on a framework. And the framework can be made of steel similar to a caterpillar tunnel or the framework can be plastic or wire hoops. And you can see in the picture there, there's actually a couple of different types of hoops that have been developed. The uh, taller hoops are built out of uh, uh, plastic tubing. The uh, smaller hoops are built out of uh, steel. And you can use, again, just heavy gauge wire to make the hoops. The uh, covering is plastic or polyethylene, as I mentioned, or a row cover, and it's held in place by weights. And we can see on that second picture there, the sandbags that are holding the uh, row cover in place over the hoops, typically sited on, on field soil. And again, some terminology, a typical uh, a low tunnel, uh, we have the rib or the bow or the hoop. We have the covering, in this case, it's, it's a, a row cover. And then we have the weights to secure the covering, and you can see in this case, they're sandbags, and then a tie off for the end. Okay, time for another interview. And uh, I invited uh, Kevin Prather, who is the uh, lead farmer for Springfield Community Gardens and also a farmer in his own right at Hazel Pine Farm to share his experiences with low tunnels. So let's go ahead and bring up that video.
I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. And I'm excited tonight to be interviewing Kevin Prather. Kevin is a friend of mine. Uh, he works for Springfield Community Gardens and he also has his own farm, Hazel Pine Farm. So let's, let's, let's uh, focus in on uh, low tunnels. Can you talk about constructing low tunnels and, and the types of coverings you might use on and what sort of crops you might be growing under them? Sure. Um, well, they're very easy to construct provided you start with the right tool. I actually, I'm, I'm sure that it's available many places, but the only one I know for sure that, that carries a tunnel bender, which is essentially an arced piece of metal that you would feed like half inch electric conduit through and bend it as you push it through and it will give you the arch that you're looking for. Um, Johnny Seed is, is who I buy that from. I, it, it may be carried elsewhere. Um, but yeah, you essentially just mount this tunnel bender on either a trailer hitch or a picnic table or a really sturdy pallet. Um, and you buy your electric conduit at like, you know, I, I think like about seven feet, eight feet might do the trick, maybe up to 10 feet. Um, and you just feed it through and bend it. At that point, uh, in your field, you would want to space them out about every five feet or so. And that's just if you have any rain load or snow load, um, there's not too much distance between your bows to really sag. Um, you really want to jam it in, otherwise it, it might it might sort of flop over if uh, if your soil is soft or if you have a lot of tension on the fabric itself pulling your ends inward. Um, it, it, I mean, it can be useful for for a lot of different crops. I tend to use them more in the, in the winter to um, farm all four seasons. So I'll use it on things like kale and arugula, some winter spinach, even carrots and radishes do really well under cover in winter. During the summer, I kind of switch out my insulation blankets for the insect netting. Um, and anybody who's tried to grow arugula in the summer, you know that like flea beetles are really bad. Um, insect netting really helps keep those away. Um, yeah, and, and really, I mean, any pest, depending on the type of how small the diameter of the holes of your insect netting is, you can pretty much keep everything out. So how do you anchor the edges of whatever covering you're putting on the uh, low, ah, low top? Excellent question. All right. So you definitely want to have your fabric longer than the length of, of your set of bows. So say you have a 50 foot bed, you're going to want at least four feet, six is even better. Um, and you essentially start by finding the peak of your bows on either side and making sure that your fabric's center is in the center of the peaks of the bows. Um, at that point, you would just sort of wrap it around sort of like a, the end of a bread bag that you're going to put a twist tie on. And you stand back or any sort of weight to, to hold down that side. And then from there, um, I tend to work from the center and then work to each direction. Um, but you would place sandbags at the base of each of the bows. And the idea is to, from each sandbag you put on a bow, you want to stretch it tight to the other bow and hold it down. The reason you want to do this is to protect against the wind. This fabric, if you don't have it uh, weighed down enough, it can be like a kite. It'll just fly away. So you want to make sure that all of the creases are removed so that the wind has nothing to catch. So I will typically use a sandbag at each end of each bow all the way down and then one on each end cap as it's cinched. Well, very good. This is Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist, the University of Missouri Extension. That was great. Um, there was a question in the chat um, asking if we would be able to email a copy of this webinar. Um, and absolutely, uh, we will be able to email you a copy of this video, um, but we will also be posting this on Facebook uh, for you to access tomorrow. Very good, thank you. Uh, anything else in the chat? Uh, not so far, but feel free to uh, pop anything you need in the chat and I will, I will be here to answer. And, you know, if you don't want to type a long question in there, just type in, you know, whoa, tell me more about whatever it might be. <laughs> But uh, yes, please, uh, please use chat to, to interact with us so that uh, we can address any questions. Okay, so again, moving uh, to uh, even simpler approaches to protecting crops, let's talk about row cover. And basically, 
Row cover is fabric. Typically, it's a spun bonded uh, row cover uh, that we talked about earlier on, uh, on low tunnels, but it's just placed directly on the crops. And generally, it's considered to be temporary. It's put in place, as I mentioned, uh, perhaps because there's going to be a, a late frost in the spring or an early freeze in the fall. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, there's an insect issue that's anticipated or, or, or some other situation that you want to address in a fairly quick and uh, uh, less labor intensive way. Uh, in some cases, though, it is used for long term protection, and particularly in uh, some situations uh, such as winter protection on fruit crops. Row cover can be placed in the fall and left in place throughout the winter and into the spring. And here's an example of that. This was actually a blackberry planting where the, uh, the RCA trellis that was supporting the blackberries was laid down and then the entire trellis and the plants were covered with a spun bonded uh, row cover. And then the row cover, as you can see, is being held in place with sandbags. And I'll mention just one other use for uh, protective structures. And uh, again, from the standpoint of managing risk and, uh, and developing resilient production systems, increasingly we're looking towards the use of overhead structures such as we see here on this high density apple planting. And this particular net is serving several purposes. First of all, it is reducing the uh, solar radiation and this results in better color on the uh, apples on the, uh, the uh, trees. Secondly, it provides protection against hail. And hail can be a, a serious issue on, on a uh, fruit crop. And third, it gives protection against birds and other uh, pests that might be entering into the orchard. So again, multiple uses from a, an overhead protective structure. Okay, to kind of summarize the different types of, um, of protective structure, I, structures, I asked uh, Curtis Millsap again to Kind of give us his uh, perspective in comparing and contrasting the different types of protective structures. So let's take a look at what Curtis had to say about that. I'm Patrick Byers, Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and it's my pleasure today to be interviewing my friend Curtis Millsap. Curtis is a farmer north of Springfield at Millsap Farm, and I've invited him to join us to talk about the reasons that he is excited and interested in growing crops under protection. I've been out to your farm uh, many times, and I've been, it's been very interesting to see the different types of protective covers that you use. And, uh, if, would you go ahead and just sort of compare and contrast the uh, different types of structures and coverings that you use? Yeah, so, you know, starting from a very base level, you can see in the foreground of this background picture here we've got that um, we use a lot of row covers. And sometimes we put those row covers on hoops. Sometimes we put those row covers flat on top of the crops. But a basic floating row cover is, you know, it's a permeable uh, fabric. So the water and the, and the air can pass through, but it gives a little bit of frost protection, gives a lot of wind protection. So that's kind of the first layer of protection on the farm. And a lot of times that's enough in the case of something like a spinach crop or even sometimes even a kale crop, that may be enough to get it through the winter. Certainly in the spring, it's enough to get it a month of earliness out in the field for those frost hardy crops. And then the next layer of protection for us would be uh, some sort of simple uh, plastic tunnel. And so we build a lot of these. We've got uh, several, we call them kitten tunnels because they're kind of smaller than what we would call a caterpillar tunnel, but they're 15 feet wide, they're seven feet tall. They're made out of a single piece. Uh, the hoop is made out of a single piece of 24 foot long chain link top rail. And it's a single layer of plastic. And rather than having a lot of uh, structure to it, it's really a simple thing. It sits on stakes. It's got a single purlin down the middle. And the, the plastic is held on by sort of lacing back and forth with rope or old used poly uh, drip line. And those structures are smaller uh, than, than our bigger structures. And so they have less capacity to hold temperature. But they do a really fabulous job of growing head lettuce, spinach, kale, uh, choy, all those kinds of frost hardy crops all through the winter. And we can get about a month or even a little more jump start in the spring on some of our warm weather crops as well in those tunnels. Um, the other thing I really like about those tunnels is they're very easy to, to pull up stakes and move, literally pull the stakes up. We disassemble them. And I can, with, a, with, my, uh, with one or two helpers, I can pull one of those down, 
move it to a new plot and put it back up uh, in a day. And so that's really nice in terms of soil health, the ability to, to rotate. Uh, because one of the issues we run into in covered space growing is soil quality and, and, and degradation. Uh, and then the next step up for me is what people would generally call a high tunnel. And so that's a pretty typical uh, a pipe structure. It's going to be a galvanized pipe. It's much heavier duty than the, than the kitten tunnels are. So we're now uh, the tunnels I've got, uh, the high tunnels I've got are two and three eighths inch pipe. Uh, I've got a 30 foot span and a 34 foot span, both of them 96 feet long. And those structures are great because we never worry about them in snow. They are really durable structures. Um, they, it's, they're big enough that they hold temperature better, so we get a little better frost protection in those. And they're a big open space to work in. Uh, we don't have them set up this way, but many of my friends have them set up in, in a way they can drive a tractor into them. And so that's handy too when you get a big enough space like that. Now you're able to work them, uh, work the soil with a tractor if that's what you want to do. Um, and then the final layer of protection on our farm, oh, and I, I, should, I should quit differentiate. So the high tunnels don't have any supplemental heat. And up till now, we have not talked about any sort of supplemental heat. The only thing I'll do in the high tunnels is in the, in the early tomatoes, I will bring uh, some of those propane torpedo heaters, so one heater per tunnel, and I'll run that just as a, um, just as a kind of insurance. So on a 28-degree you know, night or something, um, I'll put row covers over the tomatoes, but I'll also bring a, a torpedo heater in there, and I'll run that overnight. It'll cost me about $15 in propane to run one of those overnight, and it'll protect us from frost down to about 23 is as low as I've seen that go and have that, that propane heater work. Pretty simple, easy, low-cost protection, but it's nothing permanent. And then we go into our biggest structure, and that is a greenhouse. Um, and it's, it's built uh, in the concrete foundation. It actually has sidewalks, things like that. One of the, my predecessor used it to grow nursery crops. We grow primarily plants, I mean, uh, primarily food, but of course we also grow all of our seedlings in there as well. And it has a propane furnace and a wood furnace. Uh, it has permanent uh, hydrants and hoses everywhere. You know, it's a very uh, utilitarian uh, growing structure but also has some of the bells and whistles that make it more comfortable to work with and, and a certain level of automation. So it's got thermostats and fans, things like that. So it's kind of, as you look at the spectrum, it goes from that simple row cover laid on top of plants all the way up to this you know, two layer plastic on top of serious metal structure that has electricity and furnaces and things like that. So we really have a full spectrum of options and all of them have their place. You know, there's, there's certainly an increasing price spectrum. So as somebody gets started and you know, as I got started, Certainly the low cost options were the ones that made sense. But as we've been able to upgrade, uh, some of the, the nice things about like a high tunnel is it's a little bit easier to work with. It's, it costs a little more, but it requires a little less of the grower in terms of daily work. So, uh, so in some ways, what I see the differential as you work your way up the scale is uh, the, the, more, the higher you get up the cost and, and sort of, um, uh, we'll say, uh, utility, scale so you know the more useful and the more it heats and takes care of the plants the more the the less it requires of the grower to put in grunt work each day and and vice versa so you can kind of trade money for labor in a sense so that's that's one way to think of how the tunnels work and then the other way to think of it is you know, at the low end of the spectrum you're doing minimal protection and so you're going to expect minimal increase for that and then when you get into an actual greenhouse where you can control, control nighttime temperatures to a high degree I mean we can keep a 50 degree nighttime temperature in our greenhouse through the winter if we want to with those wood furnaces and the, and the propane furnace now we're talking about a structure that can do a tremendous amount in terms of production uh, that, that those high tunnels and, and ground covers really can't so there's a there's a trade-off there um, and I think everybody has to kind of find their sweet spot within that uh, spectrum but uh, but that's what we do I'm Patrick Byers, field specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and I want to thank Curtis Millsap for joining me today to talk about his experiences with protected culture. Again, Curtis is a uh, perspective on protected culture is, is very interesting and I think very, very pertinent for, for uh, the farming experience in our part of the world. Thank you, Curtis. All right, let's turn our attention now to the crops that, that are suitable for growing under protective structures. And I could, I could summarize this easily by saying everything does well under protective structures. And that in most cases is, is the case. And, and in fact, we're seeing some uh, uh, crops being grown in high tunnels that 
would not have been considered in, in years past because it does tend to be a favorable environment. But we've known uh, or we've learned over the years that there are certain crops that are particularly well suited from the standpoint of production and also from the standpoint of value for protective structures. Uh, vegetables are widely grown under uh, protective culture. Uh, a number of different types of herbs, particularly culinary herbs, are being grown under uh, protective culture. Uh, fruits, cut flowers, and ornamentals are all potential crops to be considered for, uh, for protect protected culture. Now, if we look at the experience here in the uh, Midwest, uh, for uh, several years at the Great Plains Growers Conference, the attendees who were using high tunnels in particular were surveyed as far as the crops that they were growing in those high tunnels. And again, granted, the, uh, the data uh, are, are a bit old from, the, uh, you know, from 2004 and 2005, but it's my experience that these numbers are very similar to the situation today. And by far the most commonly grown crop is tomatoes. And, and again, for good uh, reason, uh, tomatoes are a valuable crop and they perform to their best in a protected environment. Other crops that are widely grown include cu uh, cucurbits, uh, cucumbers in particular, but also various types of squashes, various types of salad greens and spinach, and then increasingly crops like uh, bell peppers and strawberries and cut flowers. And in fact, cut flowers are definitely a growth industry at the moment. And we had a recent workshop on cut flowers that uh, highlighted the potential for cut flowers as a commercial crop here in, in uh, the uh, Midwest. Now, if we look at some specific crops, uh, cool season root crops, these are useful for uh, certainly uh, fall, winter, and spring production, and there are some heat tolerant types that can be grown during the summer as well. But beets, carrots, potatoes, radishes, and turnips. Cool season surface crops like cabbages, uh, cauliflowers, lettuce, and spinach. A number of long season crops, uh, the cucurbits in particular. Uh, then the warm season fruiting crops, cucumbers, eggplants, green beans, okra, peppers, summer squash, and the king of uh, tomatoes, of course. And then increasingly small fruits and berries. Strawberries lead the way, but we're now seeing uh, protective culture used for raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. Now, the benefits of protective structures. And uh, again, Curtis did a nice job of, of highlighting why he grows under protective structures. And let's, let's take a, a little bit deeper look at some of the reasons why we might consider using protective structures to grow specialty crops. So you can kind of sum these up in season extension, uh, protection, the uh, control of the environment, uh, improving yields and quality, uh, developing profit centers and increasing revenue, reducing problems related to pests, diseases, and weeds, and then growing for personal consumption. Now notice uh, on some of these uh, considerations, you know, for example, reduce pest, disease, and weed pressure, these are not pest-free environments, and these issues still need to be managed, which we'll discuss uh, a little bit later on in the workshop. But definitely management, uh, there, there are tools at your disposal that are unique to protective growing structures. Let's talk about season extension first. Uh, protective culture allows you to alter soil temperatures. And this is very important from the standpoint of early production in the spring and late production in the fall. You can typically build at least four weeks of earliness or four weeks of lateness, depending on the crop that you're growing. The environment is typically described as being one hardiness zone warmer than open field production. And this can be huge, particularly with some of the less hardy crops. Uh, you can increase the rate of plant growth by having warmer daytime temperatures and warmer nighttime temperatures. It can result in out of season production. And this of course can, can as Curtis mentioned, give you production during periods of time where there, there's less competition and the crops are higher value. Tomatoes in particular, you can produce crops four to six weeks earlier, and you can produce past the first frost into the fall. And then cold hardy crops can be easily adapted to late fall, winter, and spring production and sales through the use of protective culture. And in fact, the, the winter production of crops is a growth industry in the Midwest. And again, just to highlight a USDA plant hardiness zone maps, and again, looking at Missouri as, as a, a uh, typical Midwestern state, you can see that frequently we're, we're working with environments of zone four to, to six. And it, by using a protective culture, we can definitely move into growing crops that are less hardy and extending our season. Weather protection is a huge, huge benefit of growing under protective culture. And in fact, there are some crops such as the raspberries that we see in this picture here 
where it's very difficult to profitably, profitably produce field-grown raspberries in the Midwest. But by moving them into a protected culture situation under a structure, raspberries can be a profitable part of, of the mix of crops on the farm. But the uh, protective structures can give us protection from temperature extremes, either too warm or too cold. It can also protect against high winds. It can protect against drought. We can very carefully uh, uh, apply water to meet the needs of crops in a protected culture setting. It can be very helpful in protecting against rain and hail and also snow from the standpoint of late fall, winter, and early spring production. Uh, we can certainly manage the environment in a high tunnel. We can manage, as I uh, pointed out earlier, irrigation very carefully. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. But we can also manage fertility. Plants stay dry in the protected uh, environment, which generally leads to less disease issues. It's not a place where there are no disease issues, but the spectrum shifts and generally disease management is easier under protected culture. And to some degree, we can also uh, control temperature. And as Curtis pointed out, the, uh, the environment from the standpoint of, of uh, performing tasks is much more favorable under a high tunnel. I've worked in my high tunnel when it's been pouring down rain outside. I can listen to the sound of the rain on the, the uh, plastic sheet over my head, and I can still be working and performing tasks even when the uh, weather is inclement. We have documented through research and farmers' experiences the protected culture leads to increased yields and quality. Curtis pointed this out as well. And again, it's due to the protected environment and certainly due to the longer growing season, the faster rate of growth that we see with crops, higher productivity, better quality, and a better percentage of the crop that is of marketable quality. We see increased revenue per square foot. You know, if we were to compare per square foot production in an open field to per square foot production in under protected culture, particularly in a, a high tunnel or a greenhouse, we can double or even triple the uh, return, the gross return on that square foot area of production. We can also use protected culture to uh, make feasible organic or low pesticide use production. And that of course can lead to crops that are more valuable because of, of the, those uh, differentiations. We see a higher yield per square foot uh, because of intensive management. We can also effectively use trellises and other ways of growing crops and changing their orientation of growth to improve production per square foot. We can also have double or triple cropping of a particular square foot of production area under protected culture. We can grow and market year round and we can spread labor and income over the entire year, all of which can increase the revenue for, for a farm. And then of course, we don't want to neglect the fact that we can use protective culture for personal consumption. I've been in many home vegetable and fruit gardens where I'm seeing people building, uh, particularly caterpillar tunnels and low tunnels, but even more sophisticated structures that would qualify as high tunnels to grow produce for home consumption. Obviously it, it can be a, a way to save money on your grocery bill and reduce your carbon footprint, but there's something very satisfying about growing your own food. And the same stressors that, uh, that affect crops on farms affect crops in our home gardens. And we can overcome those stresses by using protective culture. Now, some of the challenges of protective structures, again, they're not gonna solve all of the issues. And in fact, they bring with them some of their own challenges from the standpoint of management. So it's important to recognize that, particularly if you're new to protective culture. So let's look at the big picture. There is a cost from the standpoint of, of, of erecting protective structures. And then of course, there's a cost to maintaining these structures. There are pest problems under protective culture. It may be different than what is in the field, but there is a spectrum of pests. There is the responsibility of the farmer, the gardener to monitor this protective structure. You know, to use these things effectively, they have to be monitored. Uh, crop rotation can be difficult, particularly with permanent structures, with fixed high tunnels or greenhouses. The climate can be a problem uh, from the standpoint of developing structures that can endure climate, climatic stresses. And then issues related to soil management become critically important in protective structures, particularly those protective structures that are permanent in nature. And so we have to recognize the importance of maintaining soil health under high tunnels, in greenhouses, and even in some cases under, uh, under uh, more temporary structures. So again, the initial cost and maintenance, uh, 
generally the initial cost, particularly with a greenhouse, but, but even with a hot tunnel is a multi-year payback situation. The costs range from two to $7 per square foot. The costs can be impacted by a number of factors. Again, the location, the type of crop that you're growing, the type of structure that you're putting up, the technology that you might be installing. Uh, all of these things impact the initial cost of a protective structure. And then from the standpoint of maintenance, uh, obviously galvanized metal frames are long-term and you should have a life of at least 30 to 40 years. The covering though is, is uh, going to need to be replaced at intervals. Typically, greenhouse grade six mil plastic should last four to five years, uh, although it may need to be replaced more frequently. I remember a situation where a farmer just installed a new covering on a high tunnel and lo and behold, the next week there was a hailstorm that peppered that tunnel with holes and the plastic had to be replaced. Accidental, accidental punctures from you know, just accidents or vandalism need to be uh, taken into consideration as well. And then if you have wood components in a protective structure, those will need to be replaced periodically as well. Obviously, uh, treated, pressure treated, rot resistant wood components can be helpful. Uh, metal components can be helpful as well to reduce the maintenance for uh, baseboards, hip boards, and end walls. So again, monitoring, uh, these, these structures don't take care of themselves. Uh, to get the best use out of them, they need to be monitored. And this is particularly true during the, the uh, spring and fall seasons when we can see huge temperature swings and we can see fluctuations in, in uh, uh, sunny versus cloudy days. Temperatures can very quickly rise inside of a greenhouse, a high tunnel or a caterpillar tunnel to harmful levels. And uh, you know, if the uh, tunnel is closed up and there's no provision for ventilation, crops can very quickly die. Now, we'll, we'll talk a, a moment uh, in, a, in a moment about automation, but uh, from the standpoint of monitoring, in, in other words, so you don't have to be tied to, to that tunnel and, and uh, managing it, you can automate some aspects of the uh, controls. You know, for example, uh, automatic uh, systems can be developed to raise and lower the side curtains to, to allow for ventilation during sunny days during, during the uh, spring and the fall. Typically during the summer, the, the, uh, the uh, Curtains are left open and end vents are left open as well. But again, during spring and fall, when, when uh, uh, the uh, curtains may need to be open and closed multiple times during the day, automation can be very helpful from the standpoint of management. Labor, uh, again, uh, extending the season is a fabulous thing to consider, but make sure that you have labor in place to, uh, to uh, take, take that into account. And it does require more labor per square foot to grow crops under protective structure than it does in the, in the field. And that's just related to the more intensive culture and to the fact that plants grow more quickly under protected environments. Um, weed growth is also uh, breathtaking in under protected environments. So make sure that you have a plan in place from the standpoint of managing weed, weeds. Now, that labor issue, it, from the standpoint of management is easier under protected culture. Again, for the reasons that Curtis brought out in his interview. Uh, I did wanna show a quick uh, YouTube video. Kansas State University has been a leader in developing high tunnel technology for the Midwest and particularly for the work of Dr. Kerry Rivard in uh, different types of uh, coverings for high tunnels, different construction types and management practices for crops within the high tunnels. And so I wanted to show this uh, YouTube video that is related to high tunnel management. So along with intensive production comes relatively intensive management of the crops within the high tunnels. Again, keep in mind this is your most valuable real estate on the farm. And so it's important to not let it go by the wayside and to make sure you're managing it well. One of the things that you're going to have to do daily is to manage those sidewalls in order to let ventilation in. And early in the spring, you're going to have to close them at night. Now, the typical rule of thumb for warm season crops is if it gets colder than 55 degrees Fahrenheit at night, then you want to close that sidewall all the way and keep it buttoned up to help retain the warmth at nighttime. However, it's really important to keep in mind that once the sun comes up, it's going to heat up very, very rapidly within that high tunnel. So it's really important to get outside and get the tunnel ventilated in order to let that heat escape early in the morning and maintain a good 80 to 85 degree temperature for your warm season crops. For the cool season crops, it's really, really important to ventilate in order to 
make sure it doesn't get too hot inside. But as far as what temperatures to close it at, it's sort of a little bit of a black box as to what the actual temperature should be. For something like lettuce or broccoli or other cool season crops, I would probably close the tunnel when it's around 40 degrees at night. But they like a little bit of cool nighttime temperatures on them. So don't be afraid to leave it open a little bit during the evenings. There are a number of important considerations concerning labor to think about for high tunnels. One of the things is that you're extending your season in 30 days in both directions. And so you're not necessarily just doing the bulk of your work during the summer, you're actually extending the season and therefore extending the, the time that you need large quantities of labor in terms of harvesting and planting those kinds of things. The other thing to consider is that the crops grow very vigorously inside of the high tunnel and you have to have the people to keep up with them. Most growers find that high tunnels on a square foot basis require much, much more labor than the open field, simply because you're planting them denser, you're trying to maintain high crop productivity, and the plants also grow very fast, very vigorously. Weeds also grow very fast and very vigorously within the high tunnel. So it's important to take a number of proactive steps in terms of using fabric or biodegradable mulches in order to keep the weeds down and also maintaining the weeds in between the rows and those kinds of things because they can quickly take over a tunnel if you're not careful. One of the advantages in terms of labor with a high tunnel is you can actually maintain better scheduling of your labor in order to plant crops and to harvest crops. Because you don't have rain inside of the high tunnel, it allows you more time to work and allows you to follow a schedule much, much better than you can in the spring. For open field planting, oftentimes we'll get heavy rains in the spring and so we can't work the soil and prepare it for planting. Whereas in the high tunnel, we can either put the plastic on or in the case of a four season high tunnel, it's on already and so the soil is ready to be prepped and planted any time of the year. Now it's always important to keep things safe and you don't want your labor crew working in the high tunnel when there's lightning because that could be potentially a dangerous situation. But if it's just misting or raining a little bit outside, there's no reason you can't get out and work inside of the high tunnel. So as you make your labor decisions and think about how this course of the season is going to go, it's important to keep in mind that that high tunnel is going to have a higher labor requirement and incorporate that into your whole farm labor management system. One of the nice things about growing in high tunnels is you get a very intensive high production out of a small square footage. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Okay, um, as I mentioned, Dr. Avard has done uh, valuable work in protected culture here in the Midwest, and his YouTube channel has a number of videos that I recommend that, that people visit. Crop rotation, uh, particularly in tunnels that are devoted to a single crop, it can be difficult to develop effective rotations. You know, I mentioned the, the uh, interest in growing tomatoes, and there are farmers who dedicate tunnels to tomatoes uh, for year after year, cycle after cycle. And this can lead to issues with soil borne diseases and, uh, and other problems. So we've got to come up with ways to, to develop rotations to help address some of these issues. Uh, there are other ways to, to manage it as well. The use of grafted tomatoes, for example, can overcome some soil borne diseases. But recognize that with grafted tomatoes, there's an increased cost per transplant. So you know, just we need to be thinking about how rotation can benefit us and how we can effectively use rotation in a, a protected culture setting. Climatic challenges. So obviously the, uh, the benefits of growing in a high tunnel are that you protect crops from the environment, but the environment can in itself provide challenges. You know, certainly from the standpoint of heating and ventilating the tunnels, uh, from managing cold, hail, snow and ice and winds. Let's talk about each of these here. So temperature and, and ventilation issues, again, it can, very quickly a tunnel can heat up if it's not open for ventilation on a sunny day in the spring or in the fall. 
uh, and it can very quickly heat to levels that are damaging to crops. And in fact, the, uh, the, heat, the issues related to heat are actually more challenging than the issues related to coal. Uh, tunnels offer an ambient temperature average gain of about eight degrees. So in other words, on a, on a, a cool night, if you have a sunny day, you shut the tunnel up, you should see about an eight degree gain in temperature within that tunnel. But during the day, it, it can be very quickly, you can have a, a gain of 15 to 50 degrees on a sunny day if the tunnel is not open for ventilation. And you know, a, a gain of 50 degrees can be devastating to crops. And, it can outright kill crops, but it can also take cool season crops and throw them into uh, uh, unproductive growth cycles. You know, for example, lettuce can bolt, spinach can bolt, uh, cold crops can develop off flavors if the temperatures are too warm. During the summer, we typically leave sidewalls open, but the challenging time is spring and fall when the sidewalls will need to be raised and lowered. And Dr. Rivard touched on some of the uh, temperature thresholds at which to, to consider that, but you know, on a single day in the spring or fall, it's not unusual for the, the, uh, the uh, side curtains to be lowered and raised and lowered uh, two or three times. And again, failure to, to vent on a 60 degree day can very quickly lead to temperatures over 100 degrees if the sun is out. During the summer, we can use shade cloth to help lower temperatures as well to, to uh, help manage crops that are sensitive to high temperatures. Cold temperature challenges. Uh, again, it's not profitable to regularly heat most structures other than greenhouses. And so we've got to consider ways to help manage uh, cool temperatures based upon the crops that we grow or the design considerations of the tunnel. Certainly, uh, uh, temporary heating can be helpful, particularly with warm season crops that are started early in the spring or carried late into the fall. But some of the other things that we need to think about, for example, extra layers of uh, of plastic on the tunnel. This picture shows a uh, high tunnel that has two layers of uh, greenhouse plastic and then the area between the layers is inflated with a small squirrel cage fan. And having this inflated air layer between the uh, two layers of plastic provides a layer of insulation. Uh, double uh, the, uh, the type of plastic that you choose as well. There are IR Plastics, plastics that contain IR additives that can also help reduce the loss of heat from tunnels uh, during the nighttime up to 35%. So those might be considered, particularly in tunnels that are gonna be devoted to warm season crops that are started early in the uh, spring. We can also use additional layers over crops under tunnels. Uh, this was a friend of mine who uh, made extensive use of protective layers of row cover within a high tunnel. A high tunnel obviously is in place and that gives one degree of or one layer of protection. But within the high tunnel, he has a grow cover on directly on top of the crops and layers of protection on hoops over the crops. And in fact, in some cases, he has four layers of row cover over sensitive crops within the high tunnel. And then, as I mentioned before, supplemental heating is, is commonly used with uh, warm season crops that are started early in the spring. Here is a crop of tomatoes within a high tunnel. And if you look at the back of this uh, structure, you can see a wood-fired furnace, which provides heat on frosty nights. This picture was actually taken in late March. And you can see, obviously, this crop was started early. And in uh, seasons that have a number of frosts, it can be uh, an expensive process to keep this space warm enough that the tomatoes don't suffer damage. But tomatoes are a high-value crop, and farmers are willing to take that risk. Wind challenges. Certainly the uh, wind can be a problem with protected structures. Uh, some structures, uh, it's difficult to, to adequately protect them from wind. You know, for example, caterpillar tunnels or low tunnels. But in the case of high tunnels, it's uh, uh, helpful to set end posts at least in concrete. And in fact, setting every second post in concrete can be helpful as well, particularly if the site is a windy site. There's a great deal of, of uh, surface there to catch the wind and it can be very damaging as we'll see here in a moment. We can also use anchors in place of setting posts in concrete for uh, movable tunnels. Movable tunnels in particular are vulnerable to wind damage, and so they need, there needs to be an adequate structure in place to anchor movable tunnels. So again, just to show you a picture from uh, uh, Kansas with uh, thunderstorm damage to multi-bay tunnels. This was straight line wind damage. Uh, obviously, tornado damage can, cannot be planned for, but straight line wind damage in many cases can be managed by the use of, 
of strong structures on the uh, tunnels and the uh, end post set in concrete. Snow can also be a problem. Here we see a high tunnel that was collapsed under the weight of snow. Uh, if you are uh, putting up structures that are intended to be four season structures, they need to be beefy enough. They need to have enough internal bracing to support the occasional snow and ice load. Obviously, snow and ice can be removed as they accumulate. Snow, obviously, more easier than ice, and this needs to be done. And we'll talk more about uh, the uh, different styles of high tunnels, Gothic versus Quonset. The Gothic styles have a peak to the roof, and it's easier to remove snow from, from Gothic style uh, high tunnels. And in fact, the structure itself uh, will shed snow and, and is more durable under snow load. Soil issues, uh, again, if, if a area is cropped over time under protected culture and there's no provision for the soil to become open to rainfall to flush salts out of the soil, we can have issues with, with salt buildup of the soils. And some of the uh, symptoms of salt buildup, uh, high salinity or root dieback, um, plant stunting, leaf burning, particularly on lettuce and greens, and then wilting because the uh, root systems are not able to take up moisture in soils that have high levels of salts. Uh, salt salinity sensitive, sensitivity varies by crop, and some crops such as lettuce are extremely vulnerable to, to salinity buildup. How do we manage salinity buildup? Well, if possible, take the cover off and open the soil to rainfall. Uh, the other approach that, that can be helpful, well, you, you can flush salts out of soils under permanent cover by, by flooding the soil, but this has implications, uh, negative implications from the standpoint of of soil health, but it can be done that way. But the other option is to use movable tunnels, where tunnels can be moved off of production sites to allow natural rainfall to flush salts out of the soil profile. Uh, another interview with Curtis Millsap. Curtis has used protective structures for a number of years, and so he has a, a good a degree of experience in managing some of the challenges of growing in protective structures. So I asked him to share with us some of those challenges. I'm Patrick Byers, Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and it's my pleasure today to be interviewing my friend Curtis Millsap. Curtis is a farmer north of Springfield at Millsap Farm, and I've invited him to join us to talk about the reasons that he is excited and interested in growing crops under protection. Curtis, uh, sometimes there's challenges related to, uh, to growing under cover, and could you give us just uh, some examples of some of the challenges that you uh, see with using uh, protective structures? Sure. Yeah. And there's, you know, it's interesting because there are some challenges that are in just inherent to any plastic structure. And then there are some that are specific to different types. So, for example, um, aphids are almost universal. Everybody I know who grows undercover finds that aphids are, are really a problem. Um, and so that's a, t a constant pest management problem because not just the aphids, but then they also vector some viruses. And so uh, it, it really that's one that you just don't really see in numbers and in and a real challenge, at least on our farm, we typically don't see out in uncovered crops in the field. Um, and we'll have a little aphid pressure here and there, but it never becomes in the field a problem that we have to really deal with. In the greenhouse, it's a problem we have to deal with on a you know weekly or biweekly basis. So, so there's one example, and and my understanding of this, and and again, you know, Patrick, if I leave, uh, if I'm if I'm omit or, or add something here that shouldn't be, but my understanding of it is it's partly due to light quality under tunnels. It's mostly due to a lack of rain and wind, uh, actually causing the plants to shed those aphids, and so we're kind of providing them with a really just like the plants, a really sheltered, wonderful place for them to grow. But unfortunately, for the, in the case of the aphids, what that means is we're getting uh, a tremendous aphid pressure. So that's, that's one big disadvantage of any sort of structure, any sort of cover. Now, if you get into different categories of structures, then, then temperature-wise, they have different challenges. So, for example, my big greenhouse, my big structural greenhouse, retains temperature really well. It's double plastic. It has a, 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 you know, a, as good an R value as you're going to get out of a plastic structure. 
and that's great at nighttime in the winter uh, or even nighttime in spring and fall. But it really can be dangerous in the spring and fall in the, when we have uh, doors and windows closed up and the temperature spikes because the sun pops out. So, for example, uh, many years ago when we were just getting started, we had a bunch of plants in a greenhouse and a, on a sunny March day. When I left the farm uh, on a Sunday morning, it was about 30 degrees. So it was too cold to open doors and vent things. And it was cloudy, so I wasn't worried. Um, at about noon, unexpectedly, the sun popped out, and I was not an experienced enough grower to know what that meant. I didn't have any sort of monitoring systems or anything. And um, when I got home, I discovered that the greenhouse had been 130 degrees for three hours. Um, that was devastating, you know, killed about 50% of our plants. And so, so some of those challenges are things you just would never think of. I mean, I would never worry about plants overheating out in the field in March. It's not going to happen, you know. Um, but in a tunnel, it can happen just that quickly. Uh, the outside temperature never broke 50 degrees, but it got 130 in the tunnel over that day. So that's an example of, of, of things that now, you know, in my high tunnels, it's less likely to happen. The, the high tunnels have a little more, uh, have more gaps. They are not as tight a structure. And then, of course, under a floating row cover, that's just not a concern. We don't really worry about overheating things under floating row covers until the temperature gets really high uh, because they, they allow air and moisture to move through them. So, so that's kind of an example. So we got the aphid issue and then temperature control. And then, the, you know, the other big one I think that usually pops up for people is soil conditions. And you're using the same soil year after year in a structure. And you really have to take good care of that soil or you do end up with all kinds of problems. Things like salinity, uh, diseases, even pests that overwinter in the soil. So you really have to be aware of those and, and manage your tunnels accordingly. Um, so those are probably the big three. Temperature, um, soil, soil issues, and... Um, uh, and oh, I know the other big one I think that I should mention is just their maintenance, their constant maintenance, you know. So as soon as you put up a structure, now you've got something else you got to take care of. And so the wind blows and tears a corner off or the wind blows and shakes something loose or you get a snowstorm and it bends something. Um, they just are, they are constant maintenance. So, you know, that's another consideration. I'm Patrick Byers, field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. And I want to thank Curtis Millsap for joining me today to talk about his experiences with protected culture. And again, uh, my thanks to, to Curtis for sharing his wisdom with us during uh, today's workshop. <clears throat> All right, now let's talk about uh, some specifics in developing protected culture on your farm. And the first uh, thing to think about is the uh, place to, to erect a structure or to, to develop protected culture. Uh, it should be accessible, uh, particularly with something like a greenhouse or a high tunnel where you're going to have to use construction equipment. Uh, it should be a, a situation where you have water available. You remember under protected culture, you're responsible for watering crops. And it's helpful if you have electricity available too. And again, uh, there, there uh, oftentimes is a point where you begin to automate aspects of managing the uh, structure and having electricity is, is necessary for that. Should be a well-drained site. Uh, you don't want a site that, that floods or has high water tables. You want a site where water is not going to enter under or into the protective structure. And it may be necessary to, uh, to uh, prepare sites, to, to prepare a level site or to prepare berms or other types of structures of, uh, of uh, structures to help move water away from entering protective structures. Uh, a site with a 5% slope is helpful. Uh, you can build protective structures on flat sites. Obviously, that's the easiest site in which to work. But uh, sites with slope uh, protective structures can be adapted. And particularly, uh, uh, low tunnels, row covers, and caterpillar tunnels are, are very easily erected on sloping sites. Uh, it should be a place where we don't have runoff from surrounding areas or from the high tunnel roof, uh, roof moving into the tunnel itself. And it's, it's difficult to ad ad adjust sites after protective structure is in place. So it's best any sort of, of, uh, of uh, uh, site preparation should be done prior to uh, placing the, uh, the tunnel or the structure. And it's in your interest to have the protective structure in full sun. Patrick, uh, we have a question from Brenda Coleman. Um, are you going to address pest control, specifically aphids? I feel like um, Curtis Millsap answered the question about they, he has to 
uh, work with the aphids about once a week or every other week? Yeah, and, and I will add to that. Um, aphid management, first of all, uh, monitoring crops is critical. You have to catch aphid infestations early. And this is especially true with crops like lettuce or cabbage where the aphids can actually be within the structure of the plant and it can be very difficult to see. And if, if they're not noted early, you can have buildup of levels to, to the, where they're very difficult to control. So the first step is monitoring. The uh, second step is to foster an environment where you have beneficial insects present. And one of the nice things about protected culture, particularly high tunnels and greenhouses, is that you can effectively use uh, biological controls like ladybird beetles. They can be released into the environment, they stay within the structure, and they, they uh, perform uh, you know, to, to control the aphids. Um, other aspects of managing aphids uh, don't over fertilize crops. Aphids are much more of an issue in crops where there is excess nitrogen present and the crops take up excess levels of nitrogen. So that can be an important aspect of managing aphids. Um, allowing some air movement can be helpful in managing aphids. And then there are uh, pesticide approaches to controlling aphids as well, both organic and non-organic. And the organic uh, pesticide options for managing aphids are frequently based upon uh, various uh, formulations of soaps. Uh, those are quite effective against aphids. They don't leave a residue though, and, and treatments may need to be, be repeated. From the standpoint of non-organic approaches, there are uh, various types of insecticides that can control aphids as well. Do we have any other questions, Hannah? Uh, no, that's it so far. Okay, very good. Again, I would encourage anyone who is on the, uh, the workshop to, to put questions into the chat. Now, some other things to think about relative to site selection, orientation of the tunnel. It depends upon prevailing winds. It depends upon your preferences at the site, convenience, uh, months that the crops will be grown in the available space. A north to south orientation gives you best optimum sun exposure and less crop shading. So that's something to consider. North to south orientation warms up quicker on sunny mornings. East to west orientation actually captures solar radiation more effectively. So from the standpoint of fall, winter, and early spring, uh, an east to west orientation can be helpful. We'll see here in a moment the difference between Gothic and Quonset styles, but Gothic style tunnels capture solar radiation better than Quonset styles. And having a windbreak on the windward side is helpful, okay, but it makes sure that that windbreak does not shade the tunnel. Okay, let's talk about the different types of tunnels. And again, our comments from this point on are, are focused on tunnels, but there is application to other types of structures as well. So there's two basic types of, of high tunnel designs, the Quonset, which is a rounded tunnel, and the Gothic, which has a peak. And typically we think of the bows as being arched on a Gothic style. Now the shape that you choose does have some impact on how they perform, and particularly from the standpoint of energy gain, and the growing space and ventilation. Uh, we can have uh, stationary versus movable tunnels. Uh, both Quonset and Gothic styles can be movable, so that's something to consider. And as I mentioned earlier, having a movable tunnel is very helpful from the standpoint of, of encouraging rotations and, and moving the tunnel off of a site to allow for rainfall to move salts out of soil profiles. Then we can have single versus multiple bay tunnels. In other words, we can have tunnels that are joined at the ridge in groups rather than just single freestanding tunnels. Quonset, Quonset type high tunnels were historically the most popular and were developed uh, initially. They're generally single bay, metal bows connected to metal posts, and they're covered with one or two layers of, of uh, greenhouse plastic, as we mentioned. And if you remember on uh, Dr. Rivard's uh, YouTube video, you saw him rolling up the uh, sides on a Quonset style tunnel using a, a power drill. They have a rounded roof and slope sides. The uh, shape does limit production along the edges because again, it's, it's a rounded side. It comes down directly to the ground and you don't have as much head space along the sides. And they don't easily support snow load. So again, here are some pictures of Quonset style high tunnels. Again, notice that the uh, bows slope down to the side and you can see in the picture on the right, the curtain is partially raised. Gothic tunnels are becoming more and more popular. They typically are single bay as well. Metal bows connected to vertical metal posts. And these posts can be of varying heights. Common heights are three foot or six foot. 
they're covered again with greenhouse plastic and they may re uh, again require additional bracing to handle wind. They tend to have a higher profile than a Quonset type uh, tunnel and so internal bracing becomes more important. There's a peaked roof and straighter sides. You can support some snow load particularly with interior reinforcement and bracing and the uh, taller construction, the, uh, the vertical sides, allows for more production at the edges of the tunnel. And because you have a larger growing space, you tend to have a more stable temperature within the Gothic High Tunnel. Another feature that can be in place on Gothic High Tunnels are not only side vents, but also vents at the peak. This is called a ridge vent. So here we see several pictures of Gothic style high tunnels. Now, high tunnel construction. Um, you've made the decision to, to, to uh, develop a high tunnel at your farm. You've purchased the kit. The next step, of course, is to erect the high tunnel. And in many cases, there, there may be crews available that can do that for you. Typically, the cost of erecting a high tunnel is, is about half the actual materials cost. So if you decide to go that route, make sure that that is part of your budget. You can obviously erect high tunnels yourself. Uh, they don't typically require much in the way of specialized equipment other than some way to raise the bows into place. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But if you can develop that part, you can erect a high tunnel yourself. So the steps in, in erecting a high tunnel, make sure the site is level if necessary. It's difficult to erect high tunnels on sites that have more than about 5% slope. The next step is to develop the layout. Make sure that it's square and then you install the corner posts and then you install the, the interior line posts, again, in, in lines. And again, I, I can't emphasize how important it is to have a square structure. So make sure that you do a good job on that. The posts can be, can be uh, dug in or they can be driven in. If there are rocks present at your site, it can be difficult to effectively drive posts and keep them vertical. So it may be necessary to, to uh, dig holes and then install the posts. Uh, using concrete, as mentioned earlier, can give the tunnel some resilience against wind. It's a good practice to, at the very least, install the end posts in concrete, and then many farmers will, will set concrete around every second post down the line. Posts are typically installed six feet apart, but the distance can vary. The next step is to construct the bows, install them on the posts, and then uh, in install the purlins, which are the pieces of metal that connect one bow to the uh, adjacent bows, and then the bracing that give the uh, structure strength. Once the structure is in place, we then install the baseboards and the hip boards. The baseboards are along the ground, the hip boards are along the top of the post in case of a, of a uh, Gothic style uh, high tunnel, or at some point up the side of, a, of a, uh, a Quonset style high tunnel. We then install the end walls, and then install the curtains and the controls, and then at this point, the final step is to install the plastic covering over the top of the high tunnel. Now, this sounds simple, this sounds straightforward, but there are nuances to all of this. Uh, it's in your interest if you're installing a high tunnel yourself and you've not done that before, to consult with someone who has experience. Reach out to your, your, uh, your horticulture field specialist. Most of us have installed tunnels. I personally have helped install about 20 tunnels and I built one on my own farm. So I have some experience that I can share with you. But please reach out and, and visit with someone who has installed a high tunnel if you're new to uh, the, uh, the process. And in fact, the installation can be treated as sort of a barn warming experience where you invite uh, fellow farmers to come assist. And it's been my experience that the uh, camaraderie and the uh, peer relationships, relationships that develop in the course of installing a high tunnel become a lasting benefit to the uh, farmers involved. Okay, the next series of slides are, are based upon the installation of the tunnel at my farm. Uh, I installed a Gothic style tunnel that had six foot sidewalls. You can see that we've driven the sidewalls here now. And uh, this was a site that was relatively easy uh, as far as driving the uh, posts until we got down to about 30 inches. And it's a good practice to have the, uh, the uh, posts at least three feet into the ground. So that last, <laughs> last six inches was a bit of a struggle, but we were able to do that. We uh, installed every second post in concrete because this is a windy site. And notice the uh, transom there at the center to make sure that posts are installed at, at the uh, same level. And we spent a great deal of time laying out the, uh, the uh, sidewalls to make sure again that everything was square. And this obviously is done using the, uh, 
Pythagorean theorem of three, four, five uh, measurements to make sure that everything is square. Next step is to construct the bows. And the upper picture shows bow construction. We opted for internal bracing. A six foot sidewall gives a lot of wind exposure and uh, we wanted to have a strong enough structure to endure that. The reason that I opted for six foot sidewalls is my initial interest was to grow blackberries, trellis blackberries within this tunnel. So having some additional headspace would be helpful. And again, you can see uh, uh, the lower picture, the bows are placed over the posts and then additional bracing is installed to connect the posts to the, uh, the uh, uh, bows. The next step is to, to install the uh, internal bracing and the purlins. And here you can see a, a team installing purlins along the peak. And then there's an, an additional two purlins that are installed uh, down the length of the bows. And you can see them both in place. Here's the uh, completed framework of the, this high tunnel. Now this high tunnel is intended to be organic certified. And so there was no treated wood used in it. And the uh, you can see on the sidewall closest to us that the baseboard and the hip board in this case are metal. Um, rot resistant wood, untreated rot resistant wood could be used in place of the metal, but all wood components have to be replaced at some point during the life of the tunnel. And starting out with the metal components, there's a higher initial cost, but the maintenance becomes easier uh, over the life of the tunnel. You'll notice also on this high tunnel that the uh, end wall assemblies are all framed in metal. And again, this is because this is a tunnel that is intended to be organic certified. But uh, you can frame the end walls in rot resistant wood. But again, recognize at some point the uh, components will need to be, be uh, re replaced as the, uh, the uh, wood rots. The tunnel now has the uh, curtains installed and the curtains run down the length of the tunnel. They, uh, uh, in this case, this is what's called a, a drop down curtain. When it's in its closed position, the uh, top of the curtain is at the top and the permanent attachment of the curtain is at the bottom. And then when the side walls are open, the curtain drops down. The uh, curtain is held in place by ropes on the inside and the outside of the curtain. And although it's not visible in this picture, there is a winch on the inside for each side of the uh, tunnel that is used to raise and lower the, uh, the uh, curtain. And the curtain has a metal a rod that runs down its length and there are uh, a system of pulleys and ropes in places that are in place that are attached to the uh, the uh, cable that is then raised and lowered using the uh, winch inside. This can be mod uh, can be uh, uh, automated and in many tunnels uh, it, it, this is a, a common uh, modification that's made. There's also a pocket in place to hold the ends of each curtain and the uh, pocket helps keep cold air from moving around the curtain when it's in the, the uh, uh, closed position. And here we see that, that same tunnel that has the, uh, the uh, plastic skin in place. In this case, it was six mil greenhouse plastic, a single layer. The uh, same plastic was used to cover the end walls. Uh, installing the plastic is uh, a job that's best done with several people to help and done on a very still day. It's also best done on a, a uh, warmer day. The uh, goal is to get a good tight skin on the greenhouse. And so the plastic is attached along one side using channel and wiggle wire. And then the plastic is placed up and over the high tunnel and then attached on the other side and then attached on the end walls. If it's done on a warm day, the plastic will be easily stretched. And then as the uh, temperature cools, the contraction of the plastic will make the, uh, will keep the skin good and tight on the uh, high tunnel. Now some bells and whistles that can be considered. Uh, oftentimes the first thing the uh, farmers consider would be automated side curtains to raise and lower the uh, curtains automatically. And this particularly is helpful in the spring and the fall. Automated irrigation controls. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> I can speak from experience, it's very easy to forget that the irrigation system has been turned on when it's time to turn it off and having automation can help with that. Supplemental heat sources, as we've discussed earlier. Metal components for the end walls, the baseboards and the hip boards are initially more expensive, but will lead to much less uh, maintenance in the long run. And again, in the case of tunnels that are intended to be organically certified can be a very cost effective way to, uh, to uh, uh, equip the tunnel. Solid end walls are very helpful. 
Uh, plastic obviously can be used on end walls, but it too will need to be replaced. And using uh, uh, rigid plastic on end walls is a, a, a common modification. And then rainwater capture. High tunnels are, are very well suited for capturing rainfall. There's a large uh, roof surface that can, can be uh, utilized with guttering along the uh, uh, hip boards and then the water run to uh, some sort of storage system. The other thing that I'll mention that is frequently done with, with high tunnels is uh, environmental monitoring equipment is, is put into place and particularly temperature monitoring equipment is teamed with automation. You know, automation is great, but sometimes uh, systems fail and having uh, uh, alerts in place that can then transmit a message uh, via an e-phone, uh, and, and a call on a cell phone or a text to alert the farmer that the temperature is, is going up can be very helpful to make sure that a disaster doesn't occur even when automation is in place. High tunnel management. So again, high tunnels typically are, are the, the air temperature is managed with pass, passive ventilation. And we've already talked about how this is done. Um, I'm seeing increasingly, uh, particularly on long tunnels, 96 foot or longer, with a, a assisted ventilation with fans either at the end walls to help force air into or out of tunnels or with fans down the length of the tunnel. Shade cloth can be used during, during uh, summer to uh, reduce light infiltration and lower temperature. And then as I mentioned earlier, automated sidewalls can make the, uh, the uh, management of temperature in the spring and the fall in particular uh, much easier. Light monitoring. Uh, we can modify light by placing uh, various types of shade cloths over the tunnel, okay? Uh, the uh, light obviously is increased when the end walls or the side walls are open. We can also use reflective mulches within the tunnel. I've been in tunnels where we, there have been reflective mulches that actually bounce light back up into the lower parts of crop canopies. And this can be very helpful, particularly in environments where light might be limiting. And then shade cloth, as we see in this picture here, will decrease light. And the amount of shade cloth that you use depends upon the crop and the type of shade cloth. Uh, what I see frequently used on, for example, tomatoes, which is the crop in this particular tunnel, is 40 to 60% uh, reduced light. I recognize that the, uh, the uh, greenhouse plastic, particularly as it ages, reduces some light. So in, in concert with the uh, shade cloth, we can, we can develop a, a better growing environment for crop like tomatoes. That's awesome. Um, Patrick, we have a question from Rick Mapson. Um, yes. How do you get your high tunnel organic certified? So organic certification is very straightforward from the standpoint of high tunnels. And if a farmer is interested in becoming organically certified with high tunnel production, it's helpful to contact a certifier before you purchase and erect the tunnel because there can be some considerations that, that need to be, be dealt with. And one, of course, is the use of uh, treated lumber. Some certifiers may not allow the use of treated lumber absolutely in a tunnel. And in that case, uh, rot-resistant wood species would need to be used or metal components would need to be used. And, and just to, to point out that something like uh, cedar or redwood could be used, a uh, very expensive wood sources, uh, probably a more practical approach on a, a organic High tunnel would be uh, would be metal components. Um, some other things to consider would be the previous uses of the site and uh, some of the activities that are going on adjacent to the high tunnel. But it is possible to organically certify just the growing space within a high tunnel without certifying the remainder of the farm. So check with an organic certifier before uh, uh, siting and erecting, siting purchasing and erecting a high tunnel to make sure that you're doing it in accordance with their certification standards. Irrigation. So the farmer becomes responsible for applying water within protected structures just by their very nature. And the uh, different ways that we can irrigate certainly can be done manually, but this is labor intensive. Sprinklers can be used, but then you wet the crop. What typically is, is used is drip or trick, trickle irrigation. And you can see in that upper picture there, a crop of spinach getting underway with drip or trickle lines. And again, depending on what you choose, uh, you can automate it to help with labor and the, uh, the maintenance. Drip uh, systems in particular are very adaptable to, to automation. Always remember that water needs are higher in under protected culture than they are in the field and they're crop specific and, 
and the frequency of irrigation depends upon soil type. Uh, in a permanent structure like a greenhouse or a high tunnel, if you're not growing in the winter, you need to be able to winterize your irrigation system. Uh, make sure that your water uh, supply is adequate, make sure that it's clean enough for what you intend to use it for, and then think about produce food safety issues too, relative to how you irrigate. Uh, moisture sensors can help farmers uh, schedule irrigation. But again, within the high tunnel environment, irrigation is regular and consistent. So uh, be prepared to, to, uh, to, to supply the water that your crops need. Uh, soil management and fertility. So again, soil management uh, in most cases with, with high tunnels, with uh, caterpillar tunnels, low tunnels and row covers, we're growing in the soil. So the soil test can be very helpful. Now in some situations, uh, particularly in greenhouses, we may be growing in, 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 in uh, situations where we're not using the soil, where we're using growing medias. And, and in that case, it's still helpful to understand the characteristics of that media. But if growing in the soil, make sure that you, uh, you think about the soil characteristics of the site where you want to erect the protective structure, make sure you test that soil, and make sure that you modify the soil if necessary to make it suitable for what you want to grow. And this is particularly the case with soil pH because the soil pH contributes to the availability of nutrients, particularly micronutrients in the soil. And with structures like high tunnels, we're, we're in this for the long haul. And so we need to be thinking about managing soil health from the very start of, uh, of growing on that soil. Fertilizer use. So fertilizers can be delivered through drip or trickle systems. Uh, that's another positive aspect of, of using a drip system. This is called fertigation. It's very efficient and it also reduces nutrient leaching and runoff. In other words, we're applying nutrients where we need them. We're not applying excess amounts. This per, uh, particular picture here, although it's not under protected culture, shows a typical fertigation setup with a fertilizer reservoir and then the blue piece of equipment at the center doses the, uh, the fertilizer solution into the irrigation stream. And then the irrigation water moves out uh, with the nutrients uh, in the stream to the crops and it's delivered through the drip system. Other, another aspect is the regular use of composts under protected structures. And again, they're very helpful from improving soil quality but you don't want to use them in excess amounts. Uh, you, you, you're excluding outside rain. And so using uh, compost, it does carry some risk of, uh, of uh, uh, mineralization and leaching of nutrients. In other words, you don't need to use as much compost under a protective structure as you do in the open field where mineralization and leaching is much more rapid. Make sure that you use quality compost. It can be helpful to, to test compost via University of Missouri Soil testing lab will conduct compost tests upon request. Uh, be cautious about your compost source. Uh, you don't want to introduce weed seeds. Uh, you don't want to introduce high salts, but a particular concern in recent years has been the issue of composts that are, that are contaminated with herbicides. And so make sure that your compost that you're applying does not have issues with herbicide contamination. Soil temperature. Again, you're interested in maintaining it, the, the proper soil temperature to grow the crops that you're interested in growing. And uh, high tunnels and other protective structures are very helpful because they buffer against rapid temperature changes. This is especially true in the spring and in the fall. Mulches can be helpful within the high tunnel to help keep the soil temperature cooler during the hot part of the year. But uh, again, one of the benefits of growing under a, a protective culture is your ability as a farmer to, to maintain soil temperatures in the adapted range for crop growth. Weeds are a fact of life in high tunnels. And you, you may remember from Dr. Avard's uh, video from Kansas State University, his comments on weed control. You need to be thinking about weed management from, from the very beginning. Uh, different ways to control hand pulling and hoeing are certainly available, but they're labor intensive. Herbicides may have their place, but frequently farmers are using various types of plastic mulches for weed barriers or other organic mulches for controlling weeds. And if you'll notice in this picture, this crop of lettuce is being grown on weed barrier fabric and there is a small hole burned through the weed barrier fabric where each lettuce plant is grown. And then the area between the beds is kept clear of weeds with uh, a light hoeing you could also use uh, weedberry fabric between the rows if you were so inclined, or you could use uh, an organic mulch. 
uh, be a little cautious about your mulch sources because they can bring weed seeds into, into high tunnels. And this is particularly the case with, with straw or, um, or uh, hay type mulches. Pest management, let's talk a bit about pest management. Uh, the environment within a high tunnel is, is an excellent environment for growing in, but it's also a unique environment that is favorable for a number of pests. Typically, it's a different spectrum of pests than you see in field production, but nonetheless, there are pests that are present in, in uh, the uh, yeah, high tunnel or other protected growing area. Now, we can actually plant early within these structures and escape some pests such as um, uh, squash bugs or a spotted wing drosophila. This can be helpful, but recognize that these are not pest-free environments. IPM is a uh, a common sense way to, to address pest management in uh, protected culture. And with IPM, you're focused on prevention, monitoring, and intervention. Uh, you know, prevention, we have some unique aspects of the, uh, the uh, environment. We can screen out pests, for example, by uh, using uh, insect nettings. Uh, that's one of the benefits of, of low tunnels, row covers, or even uh, larger structures. We can screen out pests and prevent them. We also can monitor more effectively under the environment of, uh, of uh, protected culture. And then intervention becomes very effective. I mentioned before the use of beneficial insects. Uh, this can be quite effective within an enclosed structure such as a greenhouse or a high tunnel. So again, just to think about pest control and protected structures, uh, anytime we keep plants dry, we reduce the incidence of foliar diseases. This can be very helpful. We can exclude pests. Uh, pesticide applications can be reduced because we don't see the breakdown of pesticides because of, of rainfall or, or other environmental degradation within the tunnel that we see in the open field. Uh, weeds can be reduced, but again, we have to recognize that weeds are present. Typically, they're less of an issue in a high tunnel if we think about managing them. You know, for example, the use of mulches, the use of closer spacing to uh, shade the soil, and again, recognizing that weed seeds need light and water to germinate, the area between beds is typically going to be a drier environment and we don't need to till those areas. So in time, we see less weed pressure in the areas between beds. And we don't have weed seed dispersion throughout the high tunnel through, through, because of wind. Now, obviously when the uh, side curtains are open, we do get the movement of weed seeds into the tunnel, but it's not at the same level as we would see in open field production. Some of the common uh, insect pests that are, or other pests that we see in high tunnels. Uh, we've talked about aphids and Curtis highlighted that, but other uh, pests that we see, thrips, white flies, spider mites, uh, hornworms, caterpillars, beetles. Rodents can be a particular concern in the high tunnel environment because uh, there are lots of, of protected areas for rodents to, to live and to, to uh, uh, breed and multiply in a protected environment. So rodent management needs to be part of managing crops in uh, in protected environments. So some of the uh, strategies, the release of beneficial insects, which I mentioned already. Sanitation is very important to keep high tunnels and other protected growing areas clean. And if there are infected, uh, disease infected plant material in these tunnels, they need to be removed immediately. Uh, I'm working with a farmer at the moment on a situation, a virus situation in a tomato high tunnel, a tomato spotted wilt virus, which is a devastating disease. It's spread by thrips. And when we think about managing tomato spotted wilt in a high tunnel, the first step is to start with clean plants. Secondly, we wanna make sure that we control the weeds in and around the high tunnel because the viruses that cause tomato spotted wilt overwinter and survive in wild weed hosts. And so if we control weeds, that's very helpful. Third, we wanna control the vector, the agent of spread, and that's a thrip. Thrip is a tiny insect that feeds on weeds and then it actually takes the virus up into its body. Then when it moves to the tomatoes and feeds on the tomatoes, it can then transmit the viruses to the tomatoes. Once the tomato is infected, it can't be cleaned up. And at that point, the only way to manage that disease is by removing the plants. And I always counsel farmers to, to move into the tunnel with a large black trash sack in hand so that that plant can be dug up and placed in the trash sack and then enclose so that as you take that infected plant out of the tunnel, you don't accidentally brush that plant against other plants. And then it's very important to keep uh, yourself clean when you're working with plants in high tunnels. So keeping your hands clean, and in particular, 
and I'll show you a picture to highlight this, be very cautious about soil or debris on your shoes as you move into a high tunnel or to other protected structure. It is very easy to move pests into greenhouses, high tunnels, or other protected structures. Insecticides, uh, certainly there are insecticides that are available. And then think about um, regulations from the standpoint of pesticides. And here in Missouri, for example, uh, there are differences on pesticide labels of uh, different uh, whether or not a material can be used in a greenhouse or in an open field. And the Missouri Department of Agriculture has ruled that in a high tunnel, for example, if the sides are closed, then applications need to be treated as greenhouse applications. And if the label restricts the use to greenhouse use only, then it can obviously be used in that setting. But if there's not a greenhouse label, then it cannot be used in a high tunnel when the sides are closed. But if the sides are open, then it's the equivalent of a field application and labels that allow for field applications can then be uh, you, those, those pesticides can then be used in the high tunnel as long as the sides are open. Disease control, again, keeping a clean tunnel is very important. Plastic mulches, drip irrigation, keeping plants dry is very important. Humidity management is huge from the standpoint of disease management in high tunnels. And what I mean by this is that by venting as soon as possible in the morning to allow that humid air to leave the tunnel. Okay, ventilation is, is critically important to managing humidity. Proper sanitation and irrigation is important, making sure that, that you remove this damaged or overripe fruit, removing plant residue at the end of the season. Crop rotation, very important whenever possible to incorporate crop rotation into production in controlled structures, in controlled environment structures. Elevated soil temperatures are helpful to reduce diseases. And then powdery mildew, even the, uh, should be mentioned in particular, because powdery mildew can be a problem in tunnels because it can develop even in the absence of water on the, uh, the plant itself. And I always like to show this picture here. Uh, this was at a recent uh, tomato workshop that we conducted and we were visiting several high tunnels. And there is always the risk whenever you move from tunnel to tunnel that you can track disease, issue, uh, disease parts, you know, disease plant parts or spores or viruses on yourself and particularly on your shoes. So everyone who attended this particular uh, workshop wore these uh, blue bio booties. And then we changed booties as we moved from tunnel to tunnel. And this sounds a bit obsessive and perhaps it is, but it can be very difficult to manage soil borne diseases once they're introduced into a tomato tunnel. And I can again relate a very sad situation where uh, a disease called Southern blight was accidentally introduced into a fixed high tunnel which was devoted to tomatoes. And within two years, tomatoes could not be grown in that tunnel in that soil because the disease had become so severe. The only recourse that that farmer had was to completely cover the soil with landscape fabric and then grow tomatoes in containers in that tunnel where the tomatoes were growing in a soil that was not the soil that was originally present at that site. Southern blight, very difficult to clean it up and it persists in the soil for, for many years. So again, it's a much better approach to keep those disease issues from entering the tunnel in the first place. So you know, think about your growing area as an area that you should be protecting. The economics of high tunnel production. So again, when you think about making money with a high tunnel, you know, if you're, you're a commercial farmer, the uh, crop selection is very important. So is the, uh, the market demand in your area. These obviously need to be considered. And recognize that, that you know, not only is it an issue of being able to sell the crop, but it's being able to grow that crop efficiently. Okay, it does require intense management and daily inputs, but even given that, tunnels can be profitable. In fact, they can be very profitable with the right crops. So obviously there's variable costs in, in a growing a crop and there's fixed costs. Uh, Penn State University has an excellent, excellent um, economic management tool available in their high tunnel production manual. And I always urge farmers to, to take a look at that. How much is a high tunnel going to cost? Well, again, it varies by the, the uh, style of the tunnel, the size and the upgrades, the uh, bells and whistles that you choose to install. Um, it can be low as $3,000 or as high as $15,000. Again, the average cost for a four season tunnel is about two to $3 per square foot. Okay, so you can use that then to extrapolate up to the uh, size tunnel that you're considering. 
uh, one of the reasons that caterpillar tunnels are so popular is they're much less expensive to, to construct. You know, 75 cents to $1.25 per square foot is, you know, less than half the cost of, of a four season high tunnel. Now, granted, they're not as versatile as high tunnels, as Curtis pointed out, but they can be a very cost effective way to grow crops under protective structures. It's important to plan ahead and consider your needs, not just now, but also moving ahead. And think about the style of tunnel you need relative to the type of crop that you wish to grow. I mentioned on my farm, I installed a tunnel with six foot sidewalls. There were some challenges to installing a tunnel with six foot sidewalls, but I needed that additional headspace to grow a crop like blackberries on trellis. And then cost share programs. We'll mention that and we will mention that again. The uh, USDA NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, has in place a cost share initiative to help farmers install high tunnels. And the reason that this uh, cost share program is in place is because the high tunnel allows farmers to conserve natural resources. NRCS has a mission to help manage and conserve air, water, and uh, uh, soil resources. And a high tunnel is an excellent way to do that. And so a number of years ago, the High Tunnel Cost Share Initiative was established. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that particular program has encouraged farmers to install high tunnels on their farms, over 500 in Missouri alone. The gentleman in the upper picture there is my friend Adam, who is a NRCS conservationist. And uh, I urge farmers to reach out to their NRCS office. It's you know, located in the, the FSA office, Farm Services Admin Administration office and talk with their, their resource conservationist uh, about the benefits of a high tunnel. The program pays varying amounts based upon the qualifiers for the particular farmer who is interested in installing the tunnel. But typically it covers somewhere from 70 to 90% of the cost of the tunnel. The tunnel has to be built from a kit. It has to be installed over ground that was previously cropped and it has to be used for in soil production. But other than that, there's lots of, of uh, uh, variations and creativity that farmers can consider. So if you're interested in learning more about the High Tunnel Cost Share Initiative, reach out to uh, the USDA NRCS. And the website there at the bottom of the slide is the place to go. They also have a, um, a, a YouTube site and a Twitter site and a, a Facebook site. So please uh, learn more about the, uh, the uh, cost share programs that are in place. Some resources that high tunnel farmers and, and those growing under a protected culture might uh, consider. Uh, the uh, Springfield Community Gardens Farm Incubator Program has uh, resources available and they also have programs in place to help beginning farmers. So I urge you to reach out to Springfield Community Gardens. I've already uh, mentioned the uh, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the uh, Farm Services Agency. University of Missouri Extension has a number of resources focused on, on a protected culture uh, production that I urge you to reach out to. And then a really nice uh, forum for farmers is hightunnels.org. This is a listserv where uh, there are, are several hundred farmers that participate in this. It's a great place to meet other farmers. It's a great place to pose your questions and to get input from peers. And I personally participate in hightunnels.org and find it very helpful. We have a system or a, a, a network of horticulture field specialists spread across Missouri. If you're a Missouri resident, there is a horticulture field specialist that is assigned to your county and I urge you to reach out to, uh, to your local field specialist. In my case, I'm in South Central Missouri and I work in, in uh, six counties, but uh, feel free to reach out to any of the uh, horticulture field specialists we all have worked with with protected culture, it's such an important part of specialty crop production, and we'd be happy to, to work with you. We have a number of workshops coming up through Springfield Community Gardens. Uh, they're listed here on this slide. Uh, selecting and using cover crops will be on July 11th. Understanding and managing is on July 11th. Uh, certified naturally grown on August 15th. Uh, good agricultural practices on September 14th. And season extension. Uh, on September 19th. So we'll be talking more about protective culture in, in September. I want to thank you for joining us for uh, today's workshop. Uh, this particular picture is, is dear to my heart. This was the very first tunnel that I helped build 
uh, on a farm. Uh, this has been about 15 years ago. And it really opened my eyes to the potential. I think it opened the eyes of all the people that participated. And there's several farmers in this picture that are now growing under a protected culture. So I wanna thank you for joining us. I wanna thank uh, the USDA and Springfield Community Gardens for their support of our workshop today. Uh, do we have any additional questions in the, uh, in the chat, Hannah? Uh, doesn't look like it. Um, thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, I wanted to say that there's a, there's a survey at the end of this Zoom call um, that helps us with the grants of the USDA. Um, and Patrick, thank you so much. That was so informational. Oh, my pleasure. It was a joy to be with you here today. As I mentioned before, please reach out if you have individual questions uh, related to protective culture or anything related, especially crop production. And I think with that, uh, we will go ahead and uh, 